of Psalms, the 78th Psalm. The 78th Psalm. I'm going to begin reading in verse 56. I need to see all men, all people of the male species. If I can meet you right after church, real quick, um, we'll just gather in a herd up here. We need to tell you, know, son, Saturday is supposed to be our men's breakfast. We need to talk about men's breakfast. Also, need to get a work day going. I want to have a huge service on our new land by the first Sunday of July. Right? That's July the 1st or 2nd. I can't remember what that date is. My plans are this. We're going to have those trees cut down the front by then. Somebody said, hey, I got two bucket trucks. You let me know when you we want to bring equipment in. Bulldozer drivers are ready to bulldoze stuff. So we've got to plan that. But on July the 2nd, whatever that first Sunday is, is it the 2nd or the 1st? I don't know. Um, we're going to, about 7 o'clock at night, we're going to meet up there, have a big tent service. We're going to have hot dogs and hamburgers. We're going to shoot fireworks and burn the rest of the shrubs down. All right? But um, <laughs> that way that we don't have to worry about bulldogs now. We'll just catch it off and hopefully we won't burn. But uh, we will, um, that night, we will have just a, uh, we want to, I want to preach a message out there. We'll have generators. If I have to move the microphones, we'll move microphones. We'll have a keyboard system. Uh, Sandra can play, and we'll just be all excited about celebrating at, on our new property, um, and that will be the first Sunday of July. We usually have a fireworks celebration at the Ely's. We're not going to have it there. We're going to have it at the new property, and uh, we'll, we're going to have a great, we'll have, so if you know somebody with an old-fashioned revival tent, you need to let me know so we can call and get it, all right? We, and I don't mean a, a funeral tent. We ain't having a funeral. We're having a revival, so uh, we, need, we need one of them big in a house about 100 people under there, all right? So that's going to be fun. So mark that on your calendars. First Sunday of July, 7 o'clock-ish, we'll meet out there. Yeah, we'll bring, we'll bring your fans. Mama Brittany, she's going to have a baby next week. June, June the 4th, if, if Zeke don't come, she's being induced. So one way or another, we're having a new baby soon. Uh, so if you, need to, if you need to bring a fan or a bucket of water to squirt yourself with, that's all right. Come, come dress casual, because it might be hot in that old-fashioned tent revival. Psalm 78. I've titled this message, TPC. TPC. The tempting, the punishment, and the choosing. The tempting, the punishment, and the choosing. We bought a new clock this week. The, the last clock fell off and almost killed somebody at Friendly Family Day. It crashed and burned uh, during the singing. And to thank God uh, for, that, for the new clock, Brother David and I both thought, hey, we better get a new clock, so there's two clocks. But today, because I'm starting so late, that clock means absolutely nothing, so there's no Amen. need to look at it. All right, I'm going to preach this message. God laid it on my heart and has convicted me with this message, so I'm not even going to act like there's a clock on the wall. Can the church please say amen? Amen. And that means so be. Now, Sister Tina, I know this is your first Sunday. Don't you get nervous if we go past 12, all right? It's going to be all right. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Psalm 78, verse 56. Listen to these words carefully. Yet they tempted and provoked the Most High God and kept not His testimonies, but turned back and dealt unfaithfully like their fathers. They were turned aside like a deceitful bow. They provoked Him to anger with their high places and moved Him to jealousy with their graven images. Listen to verse 59. When God heard this, He was wroth and greatly abhorred Israel. So, th so that he forsook the tabernacle of Shiloh, the tent which he placed among men, and he delivered his strength into captivity and his glory into the enemy's hand. He gave his people over also unto the sword and was wroth with his inheritance. The fire consumed their young men and their maidens were not given to marriage. Their priests fell by the sword and their widows made no lamentations. Then the Lord awakened as one out of a sleep, and like mighty, a mighty man that shouteth by reason of wine. <clears throat> and he smoked his enemies in the hinder parts. He put them into a perpetual reproach. Moreover, he refused the tabernacle of Joseph. And he chose not the tribe of Ephraim, but he chose the tribe of Judah, the Mount Zion which he loved. He built a sanctuary like a high palace, like the earth which he had established forever. He chose David, also his servant, and took him from the sheepfolds. From following the ewes, great with young, he brought him to feed Jacob his people and Israel his inheritance. So he fed them according to the integrity of his heart. That's a sermon all by itself. He fed them according to the integrity of his heart, and he guided them 
by the skillfulness of His hands. Let's pray. Father, God, I thank You so much for this wonderful congregation. I thank You for Dylan and for Sarah and how we've been able to celebrate their wonderful accomplishment. We thank You, God, that You've been able to bless them tremendously with graduating high school. We thank You for the wonderful songs that have been sung. We thank You for the praise. But now, God, may I ask You to please help us to stay focused on this Word. May I ask You, God, to please stay, help us, God, to, to keep our attention and help us, God, to not worry about time, but help us, God, to, to be focused on what You have to say this morning. And Jesus, I just pray that You use me as a vessel. I pray that You'd anoint me. I pray, God, that You'd speak like a mighty man of honor through me. God, please just turn my mouth of stone into a mouth of bread that I can feed this congregation the true bread of life. Touch me today so I can be a willing vessel. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. 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 TPC. This morning I want to look into a passage and I want to encourage you. I hopefully want God to convict you and I want to guide you. A word that I believe this morning has the potential to change your life. No doubt about it. In Psalm 78, if you read the first part of this chapter, you'll find the testimony of the children of Israel. You'll see how they, God delivered them by His mighty outstretched hand. And, and then you'll read where the, there's peaks and valleys in their, in their obedience. They're, they're obedient, they're, and then all of a sudden they're not obedient. They're, they're faithful and then they're not faithful to God and His call on their life. You can read about His miracles. You can read about His mercies. Unfortunately, you can also read how the children of Israel backslid. Let me, let me give you some words and some, that describe the relationship of the children of Israel. There was peace. There were valleys. There were loyalty, disloyalty. Faithfulness, faithlessness. Hope, hopeless. Thankful, unthankful. Grateful, ungrateful. Peace and peaceless. All of these words describe the relationship to the, with the children of Israel and God. And, and, and I wonder today if those also describe our relationships. I wonder if those same adjectives will describe the relationship that we have with God today. Have you over the years been in with God and out with God? Have you been in love with God and worship God and then out of love with God and then worship God? Have you served God with all of your might and then walked away and haven't been obedient? Have you been faithful to church over the years and then you haven't been faithful at all? Have you worked like a hard worker in the church and then all of a sudden you don't work at all in the church? I wonder how much different we are than the children of Israel. I wonder how much different we are than the people that are seeing God in Psalm 78. The T stands for temptation. In today's text, it says, verse 56, that they tested God. They tempted God. How did they tempt God? They turned their back on Him. They didn't keep His rules. They were not loyal. They were crooked. They were perverse. They worshipped idols and they built temples to house them. And God became very angry with them and it broke his heart that he could hear worship for another God in the land that he brought them into. He could hear them singing songs to another God. He could see them worshipping other gods and God got hurt and he got angry. After all, how could people he had blessed so much worship another God? How could that happen? How could people so blessed turn away? How could a people with such provision turn away? How could a people with such a history of, of protection turn away from the one true love of their life? However, it happens every day. Some of you maybe been blessed by God and, and you've turned away. Some of you have walked away. Some of you have been disloyal. Some of you have been crooked. and You've placed idols ahead of, ahead of God. And surely God looks down and goes, how in the world can this person not love me? How in this world can the person worship another God and put other things in front of me? How in the world can this person not bow down on their face and love me and honor me? How can this person not serve me after all I've done for them? Not only have I died on a cross and raised from the dead, but I've blessed them, I've helped them, I've protected them, I've guided them, I've been a provision for them and a shelter for them. How could they not love me? Amen. How could they not love me? I wonder if that's a story and a song that he would say about us. How can I bless the church so much and they not worship me? How can I bless a family so much and they not even see my mercies are new every morning? How? But then what? What happened? Psalm 78, I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Verse 60 through 64, the punishment. Listen to this. Then he abandoned his dwelling in Shiloh. The tabernacle where he had lived among the people. He allowed the ark of his might to be captured. He surrendered his glory into the hands of enemies. 
He gave His people over to be butchered by the sword. Because he was so angry with his own people, his special possession. Their young men were killed by fire. Their young women died before singing wedding songs. Their priests were slaughtered and their widows could not mourn their deaths. Listen to this punishment. Listen to the punishment that God pronounced. But remember... He's heard their voices worship other gods. But remember, He's seen them rebel. He's watched them walk away. He's been used. He's been abused. Here's what God did. He left their dwelling. He moved out of the sanctuary. Are you with me this morning? The sanctuary still stayed. The tent at Shiloh was still there as a, as, as a vision of God. The tent of Shiloh was still there as a place that used to house the presence of God. But now in that tent there is no God. Now in that sanctuary there is no God. I wonder how many churches this morning come into a brick building with air conditioner and pews and chairs for those of you who have been sitting and folding chairs. And the man's getting up in the middle of the sanctuary but God has moved out. Him. I'm trying not to preach with a mean attitude, so please understand, God's given me this word about two weeks ago and it's been brewing in my spirit over and over and over. How can we expect the glory of God to fall in a church when we don't worship Him and honor Him? And not just with our words on Sunday, but with our lives on Monday. Listen, worship, oh my God, help me. Worship is a lot more than singing how great thou art. Worship is a lot more than when the whole gate swing open for me. Worship is a lifestyle that begins today and goes through all next week. Oh, how God longs for your worship. He doesn't want you to raise filthy hands of worship on Sunday and act like everything's all right. And then Monday through Saturday, you live a life of pornography infesting your life. And you live a life of, uh, 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 of drunkenness and you live a life of, uh, 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 of, of, of adultery. No, he, he wants a life that's sold out to him every day. He says these people, they know me, but they don't know me. Listen, they knew God. They'd seen waters part. They'd seen manna fall on the ground. They watched water gush out of a, of a rock. They'd seen the provision and the blessings of God, but yet they worshipped other idols. They put things before God, so he moved out of the sanctuary. Yes. Amen. But then he surrendered his power. I want you to think about this because we like to preach about a powerful God in church, especially us Pentecostals. Amen. We like to talk about the power of God, the power to heal, the power to save, the power to deliver, the power to... No, we like the power of God. But the Scripture says God said, no more power. No more power. Would you know, imagine that for a moment. God says, I have the power to raise the dead, but I'm not using it anymore. These people have cursed me too long. These people have ignored me too long. They've worshipped their own idols and their own images. They've put everything ahead of me. No more power will come from my throne. No more power. I won't save. I won't heal. I won't deliver. I won't bless. No more power. Oh my God, what a judgment. Think about that in our own lives. Think of what God today would say, you can gather all you want to gather, but I will not display my power nor my glory anymore because not only did He surrender His power, He surrendered His glory. And then He allowed, listen, when the power of God is gone and the glory of God is gone, the protection of God is gone. Did you hear what I just said? When the power is gone and the glory is gone, you can expect the protection to be gone and the enemy will have his free will. The enemy will do everything he wants to do. The Bible says those young men died by fire. There were swords. They were butchered. Their priests were slaughtered. The women didn't even, didn't even have time to mourn before they were killed also. God forbid that we ever get to the place where the glory of God is departed from the middle of this place. God forbid we ever get to a place in our life where the glory of God has departed. First Samuel chapter 4. You're familiar with this scripture, I'm sure. And about the time of her death, the woman that stood by her said unto her, Fear not, for you've born a son. But here's what the mama said. And she did not regard it. She named the child Ichabod, which means the glory is departed from Israel because the ark of God was taken because the, her father-in-law had her husband. She said the glory is departed from Israel 
For the ark of God is taken. Oh, let us wake up before we have battled the spirit of Ichabod. Listen, we cannot allow the spirit of Ichabod to enter into our lives. We cannot put things before God. We cannot put things over God. We cannot worship foreign gods in our own ways. Listen, I know that there's not Buddha temples in your houses. I know you don't have little statues that you're going to go home to and bow down. I know that you don't have a statue in your car that you're going to bow down to. But how many things in your life are we placing before God? And we still expect God's glory. But God is saying, I cannot have a people that will not have all of me. Right. Yes. Oh God, let us let us hurry and realize that we cannot really survive as Christians. We cannot survive as a church without the Spirit of God. Yes, amen. Wake up before the Spirit of Ichabod takes over the church. Listen, we can go through the motions of life. Amen. We can go through the motions of church. Yes. We can live without the Spirit of God. But remember, without the protect Spirit of God, there is no protection of God. Without the power and the glory of God, the enemy has complete control in our lives. We must have the Spirit of God. It is the Spirit of God that breaks the yoke of bondage. It is the Spirit of God that sets the captive spirit free. It is the Spirit of God that heals the sick and raises the dead. It is the Spirit of God that saves the lost. It's the Spirit of God that puts the hedge around us. It's the Spirit of God that puts the broken pieces back together. It is the Spirit of God that is a fire by night, a day and a cloud by night. It is the Spirit of God that provides manna and quail for our nourishment. It is the Spirit of God that is water that flows out of the rock. Oh my goodness! We must have the Spirit of God. God, whatever you do, don't take your Spirit from us. Whatever you do, God. But we are a group of people that have the right to tempt God. But if we tempt Him, we must suffer His punishment. Amen. Finally, let me give you some hope for choosing. See, choosing. Finally, God watched His people be destroyed. Finally, God looked around and saw the torment of the world. Finally, he, he got tired of watching His young men die by the sword and by, die by fire. Finally, God had enough and God had watched enough destruction. And the Bible says almost like somebody had startled Him in the middle of the night. He woke up and began to say, no, 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 no. Enough is enough. He finally raised His hand and said, my people have taken enough and I'm taking my people back. Can I give this word, I believe, this word of encouragement? I think we're in a time God is ready to take His people yeah. back. Yeah. I believe that it's time to we call on Him with a voice of repentance. Call on Him with a voice of desperation and watch what God's going to do. I believe God's about to he's, he's startled now saying, it's time now. It's time for me to rally the remnant. It's time for me to rally a group of people that will believe for the unbelievable. It's time for me to gather people from all over the region to set up a church that will still preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and set up a standard of holiness and righteousness. God is coming back saying, I'm getting a group of people ready Stay with me, stay with me, because I feel like an evangelist. You need to understand, God is saying, you know what? Enough is enough. People have played around too long. I think they've suffered long enough. I'm about to gather them back in. Thank God. I believe we're living in a time. He wants to gather you out of your pit and gather you out of your despair. He wants to, listen, you've been through hell and high water in your life. You know why? God's been trying to get your attention. Maybe you've been going through times of punishment. Maybe you've been going through hardship because you've not really surrendered your life. Maybe you didn't notice that he's not in the temple anymore. So he's put you through all kind of adversity. So you'll wake up and go, oh my goodness, God, where is your spirit? Amen. He's drawing you back. He wants you to be a person he can choose. Let me discuss the last C as we've discussed choosing. Look at verse 67. Verse 67 says, He rejected the family of Joseph. He rejected the family of Joseph. When I read that, I thought, i got to look up what Joseph means. Joseph means he will add. He rejected the family that had the potential to multiply the kingdom. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to give you time to understand my thought path. He says, Joseph, I look at you and I see the ability to add and multiply. I can see that you can add members to the kingdom. I can see that you can add power and troops. I can see that you can bring in a lot of people and the, 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 the troops will expand. The members will expand. If I can put it in a modern day speech, he looks at churches and goes, oh, I believe that you have the ability to, to add new members and, and, and add more people and add more pews and thank God for that. But at this 
point, God says, I don't want that. I'm not looking at the family that can add. I'm not looking at expanding my army. I'm not looking at expanding with more members. I'm not looking at expanding with more wealth. He rejected Joseph. He was not interested in the, the possibility to add. Secondly, he said he rejected Ephraim. Ephraim means double fruit. He did not want the best planters and harvesters. It would seem that Ephraim would be a man that would work hard and labor in the fields long. And he would be a man that would plant double and reap double. He would be a man that would go the extra mile and work an extra hour. He would be that man in church that was there early and stayed late. He was the man that cleaned the yard and the inside of the church. He was that man that he wanted. He had everything he did was about working and working. But remember, you're not saved by works, but yet you're saved by grace. He at this point, listen, I believe work is important. Without works, come on, you can tell that you don't have faith. But let me tell you something. At this point, God says, I'm not interested in your works. I'm not interested in your ability to multiply the field. I'm not interested in the ability to add more people to the army. I'm not interested in the people in the ability for how you're going to work and bring in the harvest. That's not what I want. I've been without praise and I've been without worship. You have, you have honored other gods. You've honored other things in your life. You have been punished and stricken and killed. I don't want, listen now, I'm about to go somewhere. I don't want you to be able to add more to the army. I don't want you to work longer and add more fruit to the table. But here's who did he choose in the next verse at the end. He says he chose Judah. He chose the tribe of Judah. You know what Judah means? Praise. He didn't choose the people who had power to add. He didn't choose the hard workers who had power to produce the double fruit. Who did he choose? He chose the tribe of Judah, a tribe that would praise him. Now listen, in the middle of this verse, there's not a lot of reasons to praise him. Young men are dying by fire. People are dying by sword. Ladies are being killed. Priests are being killed. The glory of God is gone. But God is looking for somebody that in spite of the trouble will praise him anyway. God is looking for somebody in spite of the trouble. They'll raise their hands. Anyway, in spite of the battle, they'll raise worship anyhow. You need to understand God is looking for a group of people that will praise Him in spite of the enemy. I know the young men are dying by the sword. I know there's trouble all around. But God is trying to find a Judah in this place that will say, I'm broke, but I'm going to worship. I'm miserable, but I'm going to worship. It's all about our ability to praise Him. If you want God to choose you this morning, oh my God, He's not going to choose you because of your work. He's not going to choose you because of your double fruit. He's not going to choose you because of your leadership ability. He's going to choose you because of your faith. My Lord, my Lord, you better understand it's all about your praise. You ought to get your praise on. Brother Chris, I'm tired. Brother Chris, it's 12 after 5. My hunger is beginning to bother my stomach. Brother Chris, you don't, you don't understand what life is all about. Here's what I do understand. I got a that in the middle of adversity, you better praise him. He's a God that's hunger. He's a jealous God. He's a God that expects his people to bless him. Praise will cause his glory to return. Amen. Oh, my Lord, my Lord, you better hear me. His praise will cause his glory to return. Remember, he surrendered his glory. He surrendered his power. He surrendered his temple. He left all of that and walked away. But when a remnant begins to praise him, here comes the glory of God marching back into the church. Here comes the power of God being revealed once again. Here comes the spirit of God to fill a voided sanctuary. You better understand this morning when you begin to call out in God and you begin to praise him, his power is unloosed and miracles yes. begin to happen. Yes. Praise yes. him this morning. He's a God worthy of praise. Can you do that yes. right now? Praise him. His praise is going to bring in the Spirit of God. His praise is going to bring in the power of God. Yes. His praise is going to bring in the glory of God. Yes. I don't know about you, but Brother Chris, I'm not raised this way. Neither was I. I was raised Methodist. That don't even make no sense. Oh, I wasn't raised that way. So what? None of us were raised like they were in the Bible. You still have to have a voice of praise and a voice of honor. Yes. I don't care if you're Lutheran. I don't care if you're Mormon. I don't care what you are. I serve a God who says if you'll praise me,
my senior citizen friends are here. I got to calm down. I got to settle down. I just want to tell you, I'm going to go ahead and declare right now. This is the only thing political I'm going to say between now and November, because I don't get into politics, no one I ever preach wow. But I'm going to declare one thing. I don't care who gets the presidentship. I don't care if it's Obama. I don't care if it's Ron Paul or